could afford were these small panes of glass. And I got them from behind this uh, glass store over in uh, Venice. And I saved up a little bit of money and I was able to get some four by four sheets. I needed to get them up. And so I thought I'll suspend them. And the whole idea of these works that I was doing then, these are 1970, 71, was about pulling material out of its normal context and making it do something it doesn't often do. In doing so, you regard that material in a different way. So obviously glass, you know, windows and fragility and breakage and uh, transparency. And in this instance, when I pushed it up to an elevation and, and suspended it with something it could cut through, it became not only dangerous but fragile at the same time. And in that fragile place, there was something of delicacy. By pulling on the architecture, which was the way I suspended it, and attaching it to the floor, which gave it a kind of gravity, and then holding it back, which gave it a kind of movement. I mean, I was, I was really interested in making everything alive. I love the energy of material, and I love the energy that it created in the room. It was like a, a, in concert, and everything's in concert, and everything's in play. Nothing's just sitting there as if to place a weight on a table. It was, there was so much activity. And the glass had a, uh, an impending danger and a, a looming disaster and, and a fragility. And the only way you can make something like that come through is by giving it a form. And that form was intuitive. My favorite places to visit were lumber yards. And there was one down the street called Hammond Lumber back in the uh, 60s in Venice and they would stack their wood in the most peculiar ways. I think somebody there must have at some time been OCD and it made him balance and stack and put things in a kind of order. And I used to go over there and watch the way he put stuff away and then once in a while something would resonate and I found a stack of wood and I put it together just in a straight line and I thought I need to get this off the ground. I need to give it the same kind of information and energy that I gave to a glass work where I'd take something out of context. The first one of those was the work was felt too thin, the rope was too narrow. So I decided to get real serious about this piece. And I went up to um, Northern California to a wood mill near Gualala, a sea ranch up in Northern California. And what I found was a particular wood mill that allowed me to go out and I, I wanted to pick my own tree and I picked a, a very straight Douglas fir with their, with their help and their tutelage. Came back, we milled it, then I had them cut it up for me into 18 equal parts. You know, I'm sort of thinking through this piece at a time. I'm not, I'm not seeing the end of this or how it's working. So I put a hook up on the wall because I figured I needed some elevation. And then I had a, a nice long piece of manila rope I put that rope onto the hook and then I ran it through the ring. And then this repetition started. In those days I worked exclusively alone. So the challenge for me was how can I set this up and I have to do it completely alone and how far out can I come with this from the wall? So I threw the first one over, that's pretty easy. Second one's pretty easy. Now I'm learning about physics because it's getting heavier against the wall and each piece on the outside was kind of free floating. Once I got that repetition down, I got out to about the 15th piece and then it became a real challenge because I wanted to keep it level. It was a work of physical action. I participated in fully because without my risk taking and without my learning curve of being able to flip the rope up, which I learned as a kid when you handle the hose, every, every male knows how to flip the hose around. It gave me all the information I needed. And this post-tensioned work became so iconic because of the shape of the rope, which I didn't anticipate at first, this beautiful triangle that it made, and this really dominant horizontal line that was a bit like a horizon. And I have a very lengthy sailing background, years in the service, and I was in the Coast Guard, so I had a really thorough understanding of Marlin Spike seamanship. What it taught me was something I never knew I'd use in such a way, but it became my language. And work in the early 70s was most responsive 
to that kind of early learning. I was working at Ace Gallery when they were uh, in Westwood at the uh, Duan Gallery. I was installing shows for Doug Christmas there. First show I worked on was Robert Rauschenberg's show of Carnal Clocks, which were these really hilarious constructions he made. At the time, they were state-of-the-art electric and things moved and it was all carnal information. I helped take down a show by Robert Irwin and I was doing all, building crates for the gallery and so forth. I really liked the space a lot. I hadn't exhibited anywhere to that point, so I was curious. I asked the Doug, director of the gallery, and said, what's next? He said, you're next, which gave me a great deal of fear and excitement. And Mary comes out of all the work that I had been building, and it was now a matter of I have to come together with a uh, cohesive body of information. It fascinated me, and I'd been looking forward to that, but never really knowing when I was gonna jump into that arena. Mary followed all the rules that I had set for myself at that point, which was everything had to be able to be broken down into its initial component. In this case, it was cable, steel rings, glass, and some pad eyes that tied it into the ground. It also had to pull on the architecture in some way or make you aware of it. The materials I used had to be taken out of context so as to give them their a new and fresher meaning or a different meaning. What I wanted to do was use the glass in a different way than I'd used before. But I wanted to get a big plane, basically just put a plane on an angle that floated in the middle of the room. To this day, I mean, I'll show the welds so that there's no mystery there because I think it's important that you know how a work is made so you can intellectually take it apart, put it back together, and in that way, you can sort of find meaning in my physicalness with the work. Mary got a name because Doug said, no more numbers, you gotta give this a name. But Mary has this cohesive quality, which was, at that point, it pushed me into work that had a kind of cohesion to it, that earlier work, didn't do because of its separateness of the mediums being so separate. I strung a slack wire on the wall and balanced these two by fours. And it was an experiment, again, to see where it would go, how it would work, you know, can I operate in this arc? And in that arc, there was all kinds of wonderful surprises. I'd done this with large cardboard boxes, flat ones and ones with volume, anything that has a kind of uniformity. The Last Supper became almost like a, a giant pair of wings on the wall. It started to take on pictorial meaning for me. It went way beyond just the idea of it being two by fours on a slack wire. And it's a feat in a way, but yet it's not. If I do marble work now, I don't ever allow it to be monolithic because then that becomes some sort of phenomena that, oh, it can be carved out of one chunk of marble. This physicality that this has, the way The Last Supper hugs the wall, it became this funny territory between sculpture and just literally drawing on the wall, this kind of two and three dimensional ambiguity. And that attracted me enormously, especially when I use cardboard because of the paper quality of it. Subsequent to The Last Supper, there were larger explorations in heavier timbers and much larger slack wires, and then finally coming away from the wall and using objects to support the wood beams, and then eventually they became metal beams. It was the beginning of a lot of exploration in that area.